I came across uh, an amazing story this week about Jesus and I hadn't heard it before. I don't even know how scholarly it is. I think it is. I, I heard it on YouTube. A fella, a scholar of the Gospels who was talking about the Old Testament and how things connect. So, so when you get anything that Jesus does in story, there's always a shadow of the Old Testament, you know. There's always some way that you can read the Jesus story in the context of of older things. And we know that. But I had never thought of it in relation to the Last Supper, except perhaps we were told that it was in Passover, so this was very much the Passover meal. Well, that's okay. But somebody during the week was talking about a Jewish wedding. And they said that when, we'll say, the son who wants to get married goes with his father to the house of the the woman and they meet her father and they all sit around and eventually they make a bargain, the two old men, the two fathers. They agree, I know it sounds very primitive now, but anyway, they agree a price and all the rest of it, and this is going to be a big deal if, you know, two families marrying. And so they've all agreed, contract is drawn up, they're signing it, and they they have a drink. So they, they pour the groom, the man who will become the groom, they pour him a drink glass of wine, cup of wine and he drinks some of it and then in a ceremonial way he passes it to the the bride to be and she takes a drink out of it that's all but this this moment is like I mean you can you can read it emotionally it's it's a moment where he is in some way saying, look, this this wine represents everything about me. All that we've discussed here, I'm going to be a hard worker. I'm going to devote my life to you. I, I'm just going to be with you all the time. This is me. And I want you, I want to give everything to you in the token of giving you this cup. And she drinks it in the sense of accepting everything from him. And that that's a courtship ritual or tradition. And that's hanging around the Last Supper. I always wondered, like, about the Last Supper, who, like, who invented it? Okay, I get the Passover meal, but, but just that thing of saying, you know, he took the cup and he gave you thanks and he said, this is, this is my blood. Like, where did that come from? And now I can see that it came quite naturally out of the tradition. He was putting the people around him, if he knew his death was imminent, as as he probably did now at this stage. He's having this kind of intense meal with them and he's pouring the wine and he he just says it. He's, this is my body. But then he says, you know, drink this take this in memory of me and it's like it's like he's the groom 
is the bridegroom and all of them and all of us that came after are the bride who are entering into the marriage a mystical marriage in that moment take this eat it this is my body I get that like you know last I think it was last Sunday was what they call now the feast of the body and blood of Christ we used to call it Corpus Christi Corpus Christi was when you had this big procession down the middle of the town and there was a canopy a four poster it was like the top of a four poster bed and it'd be four guards or somebody would be carrying it and there'd be legion of merry young girls and walking in front and singing hymns and throwing little petals on the road and, and bands would be playing tin whistle bands and primary bands and and then if there was a, a big amount of guards, they'd be marching and all the rest of it. And underneath the canopy, there was the monstrance, and in the monstrance was the, the host, the real presence, the focus of the whole day, the body of Christ. And I, I told you the story one time in, in Cork. The procession used to go down the this Pat Patrick Street, the main street in the city of Cork, and so it was a different parish would take on responsibility for it every year, and so there was one year where this little small remote parish in the city had to do everything, and the poor old parish priest he was old and tired and he was terrified. Anyway, he got it all organised and they're walking down the big procession that's going down through Patrick Street and he's underneath the canopy and he's all robed with this endless amount of cloaks with golden threads in them and he's holding the monstrance that, you know, where the, they would put the, the host at the centre. And he's holding that thing. They're going down the street it's very intense and very dramatic and everybody's singing hymns and everybody's praying and everybody's blessing themselves when it goes by because this is the real presence. This is the body of Christ, Corpus Christi. It's four o'clock now. So it's Corpus Christi and there they are and the young curate comes up to the LPP and he says we forgot the host they forgot to put the sacred host into the monstrance they're walking down the whole middle of the street the monstrance is empty and the poor old fella the priest he says I have to say this it's rude but bear with me Feckett he says we always forget something well, you can you can believe in his despair. Do you know what I mean? Do you, do you know when you do something wrong, and not only do you get fed up that you've done something wrong, but you chastise yourself based on the fact that you're always doing something wrong. You know, it it must come from how badly we're treated as children when when we're told negative, negative, negative things all the time. But anyway, that's a little story about Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi was last Sunday, and then I heard this beautiful story during the week. Wondering all my life where it came from, you know, the, the do this in memory of me. This is my body, this is my blood. Here, drink. Just that dynamic. And to hear that that was once used as a tradition when people would be arranging a marriage. The moment where the new bridegroom would take a little sup and then pass it to his new bride. And the symbolism of that, the shared cup, and from her point of view, the sense of taking on board everything that he is. And then Jesus 
probably, you know, just spontaneously making the gesture. It's beautiful. And then I think of there's there's a a massive icon in the Orthodox tradition. It's called the bridegroom. It's massive because it's it's an image of the naked Christ after he's been taken down from the cross and all the wounds of the execution are on his body and the body is naked and yet he's looking at you in the icon. It's called the bridegroom. And we, t- we talk about the church like collectively being the bride of of Christ is one thing, but it, it's also for each individual to understand that relationship that you enter into with Christ. It's like you're entering into something like he's the groom. He, he you, He's going to be your husband. It's that intimate. But it's it's not like it's not like he's all dressed up at a wedding, no. He's like you're getting the dead body, the broken body. I used to find it, I have to say, very consoling whenever I had a health issue or whenever I was worried about getting depressed or when I I might be thinking about the shortness of life and how long there is to go. And when you think like that, when you have ideas like that, that idea of embracing the broken Christ in the crucifixion is is really is comforting, I suppose. It's the word you'd use for it. It's comforting. And and this was with me all week because You know that we're living in strange times. We're living in times of war. And war is very, very difficult. You can't get your head around war. You know, people try and get into a war conversation and talk about the rightness and wrongness of one side or the other. And it becomes it becomes very upsetting because if you if you treat war as in the same context as human interaction then it's pornographic and it's barbaric and it's simply evil but people try and contextualize it like from a political point of view and the whole thing gets mixed up and everybody gets angry and everybody be, it, it's just appalling But yet it is what it is. There's a way that... I don't know how to say it, but but the wars that are going on, I think, are, are beginning to impinge on people emotionally. And they're beginning to impinge on the way that you you see your own life and what meaning you can put into your life. And... And then that's when it becomes really hard to to believe in, in the poetic power of faith. You know, it's, it's difficult to believe in something as beautiful as God's presence, God's love. It's, it's just difficult to believe in it when you're, let's say, in a concentration camp. Or when you're in war. Or when people are, are bombing you. And it's almost as if, you know, if, if I proclaim my faith, it's almost as if it's an insult or an affront to people who are suffering in war. Because if you're suffering in war, and, and, you know, you're talking about terrible suffering, you're talking about 
watching your children maybe being dismembered, watching your parents being blown to bits. You're, you're talking about grotesque violence. And so you're watching that. Somebody tells you, well, God loves you, you know. It's like an, it's like an affront, you know. It's like it's hard to deal with what is the optimism within religion, within Christian faith. It's just so difficult to deal with it in war. And that's why I, I think all the time then of something like the bridegroom. I think of this, this beautiful moment of the Last Supper where, where everybody's around and there's a spontaneous kind of sharing and, and poetry and washing of feet and and then this Eucharistic moment where where Jesus does this thing with the cop like this is my body and and he gives it to people and it's like you can feel the echo or the shadow of, of a marriage in it and, and that must have been very beautiful too a kind of a, a beautiful poetic expression of loyalty that he was looking for from his friends and companions. But then, from our point of view, you're thinking about it as you look at the icon of the bridegroom. Because because the beauty of the night before with all the lovely cups of wine and the food and, and the warm, loving conversation between everybody at the table. And then you contrast it to to this day of the man being dragged naked through the streets, being tied <clears throat> tied and nailed to a, a cross, being left crucified until his, you know, the, the arms trying to hold up the weight of the body and the, the body pulling it down so much that they just get disjointed at the elbows. And the pain of that, and the pain of that asphyxiation in death, and then the dead body, and then, and then the, here you are. There's your. <laughs> that's what you married. <laughs> that's what you married. You know. I mean, there's funny moments we we all have when we're with somebody, and you know, he is out of control. Let's say having too much drink of a Christmas Eve or something and he begins to look silly and everybody's looking at him and they say to the wife that's what you married (laughs) you know but think about the dead the dead Christ well if you're a Christian that's what you marry because he's waiting for you and me in our own debt. That's that's the ultimate, you know, it, it's the ultimate kind of sacrament, if you like, in the Christian church is, is death itself. This mysterious moment of complete abandonment where you have no choice but but you must go. Go or let go. And I think it must be a consolation as well, to be honest. It must be a consolation to have that sense of the bridegroom. That I am making my stand with this story this story of compassion and generosity and love that ended in violence and ended in death and is completed in resurrection. And that's another big... I talked about that, like, I think recently in relation to Easter, but it's such a big thing. It's very hard to think about all that 
when there is a war. And I, I've kind of, <clears throat> I've struggled with what to say about that. Because you'd always be afraid that to say nothing is cowardice, you know. The, but then I think, what do I say about the war in Ukraine or what do I say about the war in Gaza? Is like the problem is always, well, which which side are you going to be on? You know, are you going to are you going to criticize this side or that side? Now, you may have your own view. I mean, you may be listening to me and you might be screaming because you're so convinced that one side is right and the other side is wrong. OK. But even then, you know that there are two sides. And that the two sides don't get worked out in the war. The war simply battles it out as a physical argument. It's not. There's nothing intellectual about the war. There's nothing human about the war. And it's almost like you have to wait until it's over to continue any sense of engagement. I used to feel that. I used to feel that when the troubles were in their full swing in the north and on one occasion years ago I was living in, in Fermanagh but I was always along the border anyway somewhere but but it was like you couldn't talk about anything in relation to reconciliation because there was always another bomb or another shooting or whatever and, and that always sort of muddied the waters, as they'd say. And now we're going through that with Gaza. And with Ukraine. Ukraine, you, here's another funny point. Funny, I know, is not the word, but what's coming out of Ukraine at the moment isn't bothering anybody. Nobody's thinking about it too much. We're losing our interest in it. It's all a bit dull. But there's no doubt that will flare up again. There's no doubt we will see terrible things. Because as long as there is a war, you've got two possibilities. Either the Russians will trounce the Ukrainians, or the Ukrainians will kill an awful lot of Russians, getting them back over the border, out of their country. So... Like one way or the other, it's it's not over till it's over, and it'll get worse before it gets better, and we'll again be in situations down the road where it's almost impossible to talk. But at the moment, for some reason, the Middle Eastern war affects people in the West intensely. And I've never seen such anger. I mean, we have had other wars, and all wars are evil, horrible, and pornographic. But this one is catching people in a deep space of emotion. And it's generating intense emotion of anger in so many people. So it's really, really difficult to talk about it. And I'm not going to indulge myself in opinions. I, I find, you know, opinions in a situation of war can be really problematic. There's a war going on. But it it, it makes me ask then, well, what can I do about it like? And I have found since it began, and it began now, last October, but I've found that the best thing I can do for myself that makes me feel, that makes me feel caring or compassionately concerned for the thousands and thousands of people who are suffering, 
one of one of the things I can do is go take refuge in my Christian faith. Strange enough, even though it makes it makes it almost offensive to talk in sweet terms about a God or about meaning to people who are suffering. It's still a consolation for oneself, for me personally, to have faith. And sometimes I, I look at TikTok or I look at Facebook or I look at YouTube and, and, and it's just so full of horrible images, terrible narratives, frighteningly angry prospects. And what do I do? I don't I don't pray for people in the sense of pitying them and asking God to intervene because I do, I don't believe in that kind of God. I don't believe in God as as a category. I don't believe in God as a as a kind of a, a, a separate being who is, you know, super the universe or something. There's a really interesting phrase that Marilyn Robinson has in one of her books, that that holy scriptures like the Old and New Testaments, they are actually about, they're not about God, they're about how to deal with evil. It's in the face of evil, in the face of evil as it manifests itself in a war, that you try and work out a narrative, you try and work out the narrative of history, in a way that reveals God. So it's not like that you're promoting God, you're actually trying to cope with the idea of evil. And that's very, very real in the Gospel. The story of Jesus is the story of of a good man, but he's destroyed in such a violent way that even the iconography of the crucifixion will always be appealing to people who have been suffer, suffering or who have been oppressed. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying today is that, that the sense of faith helps me to deal with the emotions that something like a war can rise up in you. And they rise up in us. It doesn't matter. You can... You'll admit this to yourself. Everybody is in the same boat here. One side or the other. You'll go You'll go for one side or the other. You'll say this crowd are right and that crowd are wrong. But, but you will raise in yourself intense emotion and anger. And, and it's extraordinary to me. I find it amazing how contagious war is in that sense and it was the same in the north in a micro level in a microscopic way you know little communities you had on the one hand the actual act of violence itself and then you had the consequence of of the hurt and wound and rage that it caused and there are people there are people in the north of ireland who were damaged physically by, you know, maybe they weren't killed, but they were physically damaged, lost eyesight, lost a leg, lost an arm, in, in bombs, in shootings. And they're still there, and they're still having to live with it. I know of people who do sort of physical therapy and emotional therapy for survivors you know on the military side people who are professional soldiers people who were in the UDR people who were just ordinary members of the Republican family in little villages and rural Ulster both sides people wounded emotionally, physically 
25 years after the peace process started, 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement, I should say, maybe 40 years after the the actual whatever it was event happened to them, and then 40 years later they're still there, day after day dealing or coping with blindness or a leg that doesn't work or a bodily organ that's damaged. Suffering depression, having to go to therapists, looking back in their life now and seeing that their entire life has has forcibly been centred around maybe some unfortunate moment when they were too close to a violent incident in the Troubles, and they suffered. And and one person like that is just so terrible. One person, I can understand somebody like Daniel O'Connell years ago saying, I think it was Daniel O'Connell that they used to quote, they used to say, Ireland is not worth shedding one drop of blood I think he I think he saw too much violence in revolutionary France. And he had a strong sense that it wasn't worth it. I'm not saying that but I can understand people who say that. The idea that you would leave anybody any one person not even kill but, which is another thing like but I'm saying just somebody who's just slightly damaged. Slightly. Like maybe loses an eye or two eyes. Slightly. Isn't that extraordinary? Once you get into the realm of war, that's the way you talk. And having to endure that all their life. I can understand why somebody would say there is no cause that is worth that amount of damage to one individual. Not to mention thousands. In the troubles in in the north, you're talking 4,000 people nearly, 4,000 who who died, were killed, blown up, bombed, shot, whatever. It's an awful lot of it's an awful lot of life, you know. It's an awful lot of people, families. For every one of those, there's a family. Four, five, six people who are missing a father or a mother or a son. So when you look at that and then you think about Ukraine, Russia, Palestine, Israel, particularly at the moment Gaza and someday it'll be somewhere else the spotlight will go off Gaza and it will come on somewhere else and it will always be about an argument of politics it will always be like like that it is worth fighting because there is a reason but it's very it's very difficult to stand on the edge of that and not be sucked into it. And most people I notice now are kind of sucked in to become, if you like, activists on one side or the other, and they're proud of it. There's less and less space for what there used to be in other wars, which was just the peace movement you know there was there was a space in the old days for a peace movement where people would be genuinely campaigning for something deeply theological which was just stop the war you know it was raging against the kind of philosophical notion of evil evil as as it gets manifested in the war machine And there's less space for that kind of 
peace now. These particular wars seem to divide people in the West. We're, we're far away from it and yet we, we belong to it more closely now than we did. Maybe it's the social media and the way that we can communicate so instantly and quickly. But I'm just sharing with you this week what I do to avoid to avoid losing my balance, I suppose. It's a phrase that was used to me one time by a great wise man, Tom McIntyre, and I was talking to him about something, and I was getting angry. I think it, I, I think it was about the North, and it was something to do with where I was living in the North, and I was just relating to him the kind of argument, aggressive, angry argument, that I had been caught in and he said don't lose your balance and I knew what he meant immediately don't lose your balance don't get sucked in You're not making things better if you get angry. And it's the last thing that will help anybody, even even the, the side that you might perceive as the right side of the argument. But what do you do to stay out of it? And I find, I find, there's a great consolation in the idea of the bridegroom. It's an icon. You could Google it. It would come up. It uses a lot of red in color. And it is the image of the dead Christ. Yet he is looking at you. But his body is wounded. And it links in with this Christ being the one that you, you are choosing like you might choose your bride, your groom. You're choosing like your companion for life. It's not the sweet and beautifully elevated image of of Christ in other icons or in glory or in heaven or in the garments of, you know, the eschatological coming of joy in heaven. No, this is from Good Friday. It's from crucifixion. It's from the story that ends in death and destruction and violence. Here, Eche Homo, here is the man. This is him. Look at him. Broken and ruined and tortured and dead. But this is the one you choose. This is this is part of the Christ that you choose. And you choose when when you share the cup. If you go to a Eucharist in any Christian denomination, you'll hear those words, this is my body, do this in memory of me, take and drink. And you remember the, the folk tradition in Judaic society where the groom might pass that cup to the woman he's going to marry and she might drink from it and it's like I, I am drinking you I am taking everything in this ritual she would feel and, and we do the same at the Eucharist this moment happened in history this moment was it, it, it miraculously got filtered down as a lens or access point that we have to the eternal moment of redemption 
I, I couldn't explain this, you know. This is so big, I couldn't explain this. You have to go to theological books. Or you have to go down on your knees, or after you have to, you know, go into the room in your heart, be alone, be alone with yourself, and just think about this presence. And I'll give you one other, there's one other amazing way to think about this. And that is the image of the Turin Shroud. Now, I don't know whether that is an historical object. You know, did it come from the body of Jesus who was crucified? And was it preserved? And and is it some extraordinary kind of negative image of, of some, you know, nuclear event? I don't know. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too inclined to dismiss it as such. In the world we live in, I think I'm more open to all mystery, more than I was twenty or thirty years ago. But I, I'm not talking about it like as the miraculous Turin Shroud. I'm just talking about it as an icon. It, it is an icon. And to the extent that there are marks of, you know, nails in the hands and feet, marks of a, a crown of thorns. So even if it was fabricated, you know, to fool people into thinking it came originally from the empty tomb, leave that aside and think about it as somebody doing it as an act of devotion to make an image, an icon of the dead Christ. Well, what I'm saying to you is you can use that image. You can get it, as I say, on the internet in two seconds. You could have it on your iPhone. You could have it anywhere. You can access the image. You don't have to go to a library to find the book. And that image, if you spend time with it, will begin to penetrate you. It will begin to penetrate your soul and it will ensure that you don't lose your balance and get angry and it will allow you, like a rudder, you know, it will balance you in the sea like a rudder would. It will allow you to live through these days of darkness where there's so much war so many images of human suffering blasting at us. It will allow you to live with it without losing your balance, with some sense of equanimity, some sense of compassion, that the bottom line in all war is not who wins, but who suffers just as a human being. And how deeply can we believe that they will be restored in heaven? Because as I said earlier, it's not easy to say that when people are at war. To proclaim the beauty of the resurrection is a really tricky one when people are fighting. And sometimes all you can do is hold on to the peace of it yourself so that you are in a state of calm abiding whenever somebody asks you about it. And maybe I'm just doing it because I'm afraid, you know. Maybe it's, maybe it's like war terrifies me and I don't know what side I should be on, and I don't know how to contribute to the conversation, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid it'll come at me, you know. War is like, I mean, an argument with, if, if you're listening to the neighbours through the wall, and they're roaring and shouting and screaming at each other, it's very upsetting. And, and there's part of you doesn't know how to respond to it. How can I live in the world if these people are suffering? 
And it's like the Middle East is now the people next door. It's that close. It's that intimate. And to you know to be able to have your dinner in the evening and and live a, a calm life and talk about beauty and flowers and joy when when this is going on, it's just so difficult. And I have no answer. And it's a very difficult podcast to make because I I don't know anything. And I'm just sharing truthfully. The idea of Christ, the bridegroom. That he be your, your deepest companion in your soul. And that as you drink the wine, share the cup, share the bread, as you consume ritually the body and blood of Christ so that you be Christ, you also know where you're going. You're going into Good Friday, you're going into the image of the destroyed Christ. And you take up those images, those icons of the groom, or you take up the image that you'll find anywhere of the Turin Shroud, and you spend time with it. You don't have to do any talking, any listening, any thinking. You don't have to have a point of view about it. You just allow your eyes to absorb the image of the icon. You allow the icon to do the work. And it will do the work. And in your heart you will awaken. And you will understand better the world we live in. That's what I think. That's what I think. And I thank you for listening because... It's, it's, you know, it's not easy to talk or listen about this subject. It is so precious. It is so delicate. It's so heartbreaking. And I've nothing to say about it. Except what I've said. So thank you for being here.